Hey guys, Jonathan here with TLD with my full review of the 13 inch MacBook Pro with Retina display. I'm going to give you guys a rundown of the hardware, the specs, the performance, but I really want to focus on the Retina display itself, explain how it works, how it performs, and ultimately what advantages does it give you over a non-Retina display. Now the new 13 inch Retina MacBook Pro, it has been working out. It's thinner, it's lighter, actually nearly a pound lighter to be exact. And that is mainly due in part to the removal of the optical drive, which actually freaks a lot of people out. Now me personally, I hardly and rarely ever use an optical drive. So for me, it's not a big deal. But if you absolutely need one, you can always pick one up for 20 to 30 bucks. You don't have to buy Apple's expensive one. That's just really to match aesthetics. So if you are looking for a cheaper one, I'll post a few different options linked down below. Now as we move on, next to the missing optical drive, we have the SD card slot, HDMI out, which is a huge plus, and one of the two USB 3.0 ports. On the flip side, we have the MagSafe 2 connector, dual Thunderbolt ports, the second of two USB 3.0 ports, a headphone jack, and dual microphones just like we see on the 15 inch Retina MacBook Pro. We then have the glass trackpad, the backlit keyboard, and this also does feature a 720p FaceTime HD camera. Now this is gonna start out at 1699 US, which is not cheap by any means, and that'll get you a 2.5 gigahertz dual core i5 CPU, which does turbo boost to 3.1 gigahertz, and how that works is it actually dynamically overclocks itself when you're doing heavier tasks like exporting, video encoding, or rendering, and then when you don't need it, it kicks itself back down. Now on top of that, even though this is a dual core CPU, it also features hyper threading. And the best way to explain that is to show you. So for each core, there are two threads and the OS will actually see all four of those and utilize them as a virtual quad core machine, additionally enhancing performance. On top of that, you're gonna get eight gigs of DDR3 1600 megahertz memory and 128 gigabytes of flash storage, which is a fancy pants name for a solid state drive. Now the instant reaction is what? 128 gigabytes, why would I want storage that small? I can get 500 gigabytes for X amount of dollars and blah, 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 blah. But a lot of you guys have to realize there is a huge difference in terms of performance with an SSD versus a hard drive. For example, a few months ago, I tested out the 13 inch non-Retina MacBook Pro, which came with a 500 gigabyte hard drive. So that's bigger, must be better, right? With the 500 gigabyte 5400 RPM hard drive, I was getting read and write speeds of around 60 to 70 megabytes per second. Enter the SSD or flash storage, whatever you wanna call it on the 13 inch Retina MacBook Pro, that is getting read and write speeds over 400 megabytes per second, which is over three times performance as the 5400 RPM on the non-Retina MacBook Pro. Now, of course, you could bump up the specs on the non-Retina MacBook Pro, but to put things in perspective, if you bumped it up to the same 8 gigs of RAM, the same 128 gigabyte flash storage, you're actually only paying about $200 more for a beautiful Retina display. Now, the way it works is the new 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro is rocking an insane 2560 by 1600 resolution, which doubles the resolution of its non-Retina sibling, both vertically and linearly, effectively quadrupling the pixel density which results in a crazy vivid image and ultra crisp text. So by default, it renders everything at 2560 by 1600 and then it smashes all those pixels down into that 13.3 inch display to look like 1280 by 800. Now here, not only do you have the screen real estate that looks like 1280 by 800 except 10 times clear and on steroids, you can actually bump it up to look like 1440 by 900 and the crazier thing is it actually renders that entire image at 2880 by 1800. It's absolutely insane. Now it is impossible to show you guys that through a 1080p video, but I did take full resolution screenshots of this so you guys can check it out. So do yourself a favor, check out the link below, click those links, double click them to get the full resolution and see exactly how many pixels are smashed into the small screen. Now, if you thought that was cool, it actually goes even one step further to look like 1680 by 1050 which is actually only available as a high res option on previous 15 inch MacBook Pros. Now that again doubles everything both vertically and linearly, so it renders the entire image at 3360 by 2100. It's actually pretty mind blowing. So again, check out the link below and see exactly how many pixels are smashed in this display. Now as far as how that actually benefits you in terms of real world examples, here is web browsing at the standard 2560 by 1600 resolution. This is gonna provide the least amount of screen real estate, but the sharpest overall image. We can then bump it up to the 2880 by 1800 resolution and that's gonna look like 1440 by 900 so you get more screen real estate. And then finally we can max it out all the way up to 3360 by 2100 
and that is going to look like 1680 by 1050 and give you even more screen real estate. Now something that completely trips me out and amazes me at the same time is that rectangle right there with the video that is full 1080p at its maximum resolution. So what you would see on a 40 or 50 inch TV that is smashed into that display but you have extra screen real estate around it to still work. Now, a lot of you guys have asked with that many pixels, how does it perform? Does it lag? So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that video playing in the background. I'm gonna go ahead and move around between desktops, go ahead and do a little web browsing, scroll up and down, and you can see it does not hiccup at all. So in terms of multitasking, and as you guys can see, basic video editing, it handles it like a champ. Continuing on with performance and benchmarks, I got a Geekbench score of 7,460 for the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro. In contrast, for the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, that scored over 12,000 in Geekbench, so you can see there is a big performance difference between the two. For Cinebench, for the OpenGL section, it scored a hair over 18 for the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro, and for the CPU portion, that scored 2.81. Now, for the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, that nearly doubled it in both categories, again, showing there is a big performance difference between those two models. Now the next biggest question I get is how does it do with gaming or can it even game at all? Now point blank, this is not a gaming laptop. If that is your sole intention, do not buy this MacBook Pro. It is gonna be able to do basic gaming. I went ahead and ran Real Racing 2 and that handled it no problem. And it actually seemed to set itself up for retina settings on its own. I did also run Borderlands from the Mac App Store and if you try to max everything out at 2560 by 1600, it gets pretty laggy and I definitely would not recommend that. It did, however, play perfectly fine at 1680 by 1050, which is awesome because normally you couldn't get that resolution on a 13-inch MacBook Pro. Next up is battery life. Apple claims seven hours, and I was actually able to get closer to six, but that was with brightness all the way up. I'm sure if I turned it down and made a few adjustments, I could get slightly longer, but nonetheless, that is still impressive for driving that many pixels on the screen and still retaining a decent battery life. So overall, I was definitely more impressed than I thought I would be, but it comes down to the question of, is it worth the money? And I still have a hard time completely saying yes to that. Hands down, along with the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, this is the best laptop display on the market. There is no comparison. The problem, though, is this is a premium product and it's in its first cycle, so it's gonna be extremely expensive, just like we saw DVD or Blu-ray for the first time. And possibly as early as next year, I can see the Retina display come in as a standard option so we don't have to pay that premium price tag. Now, me personally, I think the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro is a much better value for the price. If you went ahead and bumped up the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro to an i7 processor to the same 256 gigabytes of flash storage, it's gonna cost the exact same as the baseline 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro. The catch, though, is that the i7 CPU on the 13-inch MacBook Pro is only a dual-core, while on the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, that is a quad-core CPU, and on top of that, you get dedicated graphics. So there is a huge difference, as you guys saw from the benchmarks, and this is why I feel the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro is a much better value. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the 13-inch form factor for a laptop as far as portability. If it had a quad-core CPU and dedicated graphics, I would be all over it in a second. And hopefully next year, alongside the lower price point, hopefully we'll see quad-core CPU options. And at the very least, if we don't see dedicated graphics in the 13-inch model, at least Intel's next generation Haswell CPUs will have much better integrated graphics. If you can, I would recommend going for the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro as you get a lot more performance for your buck. But if you absolutely need this form factor and want the Retina display and you really don't upgrade every year, I would probably try and hold off till next year because you're gonna get lower price points and better CPU options. If you guys found this video helpful and you are considering picking up any of the MacBook Pro models, I have links to Amazon down below. And for most states, you end up not paying sales tax and at the same time, it goes back to the channel, which further goes to reviews and giveaways, and everybody wins. Now, if you're a student, you can also get a discount directly through Apple, and if that happens to be cheaper, by all means, go for that one, save some money. If you guys have any further questions, I try my best to respond to as many YouTube comments as possible, but it gets hectic, and the absolute best place to get in contact with me is on Twitter, at TLDToday, that is linked down below, including all sorts of awesome links like my gear, what I use to make my videos. And aside from that, thank you guys again for watching this video and I will see you guys later.